Hello everyone, and welcome back to our series, Microsoft Flight Simulator Evolution of Aircraft Design. Today's video, we're going to be diving into the 1970s of aircraft. And like I was mentioning in the previous video, our emphasis here is going to be on smaller GA planes, unless so on all the big airliners and jet fighters and all that other excitement that came out. And things have taken an interesting turn. Uh, one thing, of course, you'll notice is a lot of the design innovations that were basically introduced in the 50s and 60s, most of the time in the 1970s, was just about making things a little bit higher performance. Uh, we saw a lot of the introduction of retracting landing gear, for example, and aircraft that are basic designs. And we also saw kind of a simplification of systems and everything becoming more and more progressively standardized. So in aircraft here, of course, we're starting with the Piper Warrior II. Uh, one of the things I always get a kick out of is I have a lot of flight time in a Piper Warrior too. It's just kind of one of those things. So even though it's you know, 1960s technology, it has evolved quite a bit. And apparently uh, we're about to be hijacked or something like here. Let me fix that real quick. So what has changed as far as our generation? Well, we've seen a lot of things change. Uh, the materials are staying pretty much the same. Uh, you'll notice, for example, a couple of conveniences have been added for the purposes of our pilots and our passengers here. You can see we've got a nice little place here. You'll see that our wonderful flap system, if you remember back in the day, we designed a really simple mechanism where you just kind of pull the handle to go ahead and put the flaps down that system still remains in effect even though uh, that was introduced a long time ago our ailerons of course are maintain uh, this lovely little corrugation that we saw on those 1930s planes we got big warnings of course of what type of fuel and notice our fuel has less lead in it than it used to back in the day um the other thing we can see too uh, this is kind of a piper thing but we have an all moving tail we actually have a stabilator and you can see the anti-servo tab happily doing its little thing in the back as well as all these reinforcements you also see we've eliminated a lot of those long wires for those old school ADF receivers. We've got a little transponders. We're also getting a lot more antennas because we need a lot more in terms of communication equipment. We're also seeing a couple other things that we didn't have very often. And that's things like shock absorbers, uh, which is nice. We're also noticing that our wing shapes have gone away from the big uh, Hershey bar that you're probably familiar with with the earlier Cherokees to a much more aerodynamic tapered shape, which gives us better performance across the board. On the inside aircraft of this generation have also seen some innovations. Uh, one of the interesting one, of course, uh, not that one, other than the eliminating the ashtray. Nope, still got an ashtray. Is you'll notice a lot of things have made it easier for the pilot to control the plane without going far. You'll also notice the presence of things that are starting to get well lit up a specific color to tell you what they do. You'll also see a lot more labels on items. Uh, the other item you'll see is that we've got all of our circuit breakers down here on the right. We've got simple controls for making things a little bit more adjustable rather than on and off. You'll also notice the presence of our radio systems Again, our radios are getting progressively better. It's unfortunate that we don't get a lot of the vintage radios that you would have in the earlier days. But again, you can kind of see this is roughly what you would get. It's a click, click, click kind of a radio. Uh, there's no standby mode. You can see we have audio. We have um, all sorts of good systems in that regard. Uh, we no longer have to deal with uh, kind of frustrating audio systems. We can now just plug our headphones into it, which again was common. We actually have an automatic pilot. Uh, this is a pretty typical automatic pilot of this particular era, which gives you kind of an idea of what we would have had at that time, which is pretty impressive. Other things you'll see too, uh, not so much on this one, but you'd have electric trim, which we don't have, unfortunately. You'll also notice the presence of a bunch of redundant instruments to make it a little bit safer. We'll actually have dual directional gyros. The co-pilot will have a bunch. Um, this particular one does have a Garmin GPS. We wouldn't have had that. We wouldn't have had that. But we do have things like a DME, which would not be necessarily something you would have seen on a plane that came a little bit earlier. Uh, this particular warrior, by the way, is 1973, if you're looking for a year there. So a lot of this is a little different. We also have an alternator, uh, the presence of carburetor heat controls notice we've gotten rid of the instruments for it uh, we have it very very easy to get down to the controls and like i said everything's just so convenient and easy to grip onto so let's go ahead and give this thing some power and I'll get it ripping down the runway. One thing that we have that's great, of course, is you've noticed we've gotten away from conventional landing gear completely in the 70s. Uh, people basically stopped making conventional landing gear airplanes. Everything was the Landomatic, aka our lovely tricycle gear that everybody knows and loves. And performance has gotten much, much, much more stable. You know, want to give the controls a nice gentle tug? The aircraft goes up nice and easy. Uh, no retractable landing gear yet. We have the Piper Aero for that. Uh, that was one of the aircraft actually considered for the video because our retractable to get very popular in the 70s just as a way to get a little bit more speed out of it but from a handling and pilot's experience perspective you'll notice we've got our standard six instruments right in front of us we've got the reliable directional gyro we've got uh, our good fashion attitude indicator there in the middle coming down here all of our instruments are labeled they all have colors that tell us exactly what's good and what's bad you will notice the omnipresence of course of the fuel tank selector which we've seen all the way since the beginning a lot of that is uh, basically kind of based on regulation you'll notice Notice performance wise, performance is starting to trend less touchy and towards stiffer performance. So that's just kind of be kind of something that comes out of that era. You know, if I jerk my controls as hard as I can to the left, you'll see this plane 
very leisurely comes over. I had to actually stomp on the rudder there. But we'll also notice that the pitch of this plane is very, very stable. Uh, you know, I'm not having to work hard, but I am having to push the rudder all the way to the right in order to execute smooth turns. Again, that's the flight model that we have here. We also have the presence of idiot lights, uh, something like I mentioned earlier, we don't have a lot of in the past. We have good radio receivers, we have VOR, and of course, later on, we get things like GPS and stuff like that. All in all, the planes are getting safer, they're getting more stable, and they're getting less work on us, the pilot, who has to actually fly the thing. Because remember, I still got to navigate and do all that other fun, and I got to put gas in it. And all those things are really, really challenging. It adds a lot of layers onto the pilot's workload, which makes it less safe. Another thing you probably observed, too, is that we're not a constant speed propeller here. Even though that technology is a kind of faux pas, um, no, we still use it kind of a thing. And of course, coming in the back of the seats, you'll notice passenger comforts are better. Oh, we've got ourselves little ashtrays, or we can turn the heat on in the back. Uh, depending on what version of the uh, Piper that you're actually dealing with, you actually have an overhead vent system. You can actually turn on. We have the presence of a red light for kind of a nighttime. There's a little microphone where the sound would come out. Our passengers have adjustable vents. These are really amazing innovations that we had some of uh, leading up to, but generally those were an aircraft that were much, much, much bigger. Now, this era also saw an interesting introduction in more affordable aircraft. Uh, one of the problems that were starting to happen, especially towards the 60s and as we slide into the late 1970s, is everything got a lot more expensive. And that's actually going to be one of the crippling factors for us a little later on, as we'll get to. But the key thing there is we could no longer afford a six-seater plane. You know, I couldn't do a business liner Cessna 195. It was too much to operate. I needed something cheaper to learn it. I needed something that was a little bit um, simpler. I needed something that I could, you know, mostly hold my family and friends with. Because the whole idea of general aviation for, like, kind of that weekend hobby was quickly slipping away as things like oil prices got much, much higher and the price of the aircraft started to creep up as well. Now that led to some other innovations, like our next aircraft. In 1977, Cessna introduced the Cessna 152. Now for those of you who are familiar with the 150 series, you had the 140, you had the 150, and then of course we got this great new little trainer plane. The concept was, you know, aviation is going to get affordable again. You know, people are going to need to learn how to fly a planes. So not only have our planes gotten smaller, but for those of you who've been following along in this series so far, you probably observed that our planes suddenly went back in time and we're back to planes that only would accommodate two and are moving not much faster than the aircraft that came many, many generations before it just because of the need for an economical airplane. Now keep in mind, there are a lot of airplanes at this point in history, so many different companies. And for those of you who care, keep tracking of a history here, you'll probably know that this was about the point when all the major aircraft companies started buying each other. And uh, this led us into what I like to call the decline of general aviation, which of course we'll explore just a little bit in our next video. But we produced nice gems like this. Now there are a bunch of things that make you a little bit uh, kind of hmm, so to speak. One thing is the presence of a dual speed speedometer. A lot of people were working in a speedometer. We don't have those on airplanes. We have an airspeed indicator. You'll notice it shows me miles per hour and knots. Uh, this seems like an interesting little, why would somebody do this in our airplane? And now the reason for this, of course, is because so many people were working in miles per hour. As a matter of fact, in the Cessna 182 that I fly, it's in miles per hour. It's not even in knots. Uh, that was a big transition in the 70s. Another thing you're going to notice is, again, simplifying the aircraft as much as possible. You notice we have a throttle. We have a mixture. That's it. We have a tachometer for RPM, and we've got a basic radio system over there on the right. You also notice our fuel control is on or off. Absolutely simplified procedures. You also see the presence of our six-pack instruments, although they're not quite the same that we'd seen before. One of the things I find a little amusing here is they put a clock here. And for those of you going, why didn't they just put the other instruments here? It's because the yoke had to have a place to go. <laughs> so they said, well, why don't we just go ahead and put a clock there? That'll be fine. One of the incredible things about this plane, of course, is not only is it incredibly simple to operate and uh, fly around. I mean, this thing is this thing's great. Um, one of the things that's great about it is you actually have full instrument capabilities. And uh, this became more and more prevalent. There were many aircraft that preceded this that had very little, basically, backup instrument capabilities. But they weren't dedicated instrument platforms. This aircraft has no difficulty as an instrument platform. It actually is very easy to learn to fly instruments on it. Uh, the things we see too is their controls are starting to get a little more harmonized. Uh, they're getting a little bit smoother. They're starting to regain the sensitivity they lost, especially in the late 60s and the early 70s. And obviously, there's a lot of aircraft out there I'm making gross oversimplification. But from a performance perspective, this is about as easy as you can get. Uh, these 152s, uh, they made quite a few of them, expecting uh, there'd be the massive boom in aviation, but it never actually came. 
Uh, like I'll mention in the next video, we'll get into some of the economic reasons why that ever happened. But uh, the key thing here is this was the expectation, and it ended up being a lot of person people's general aviation plane of choice because it was the only one they could get their hands out of when they stopped making general aviation planes kind of in the mid-80s. But uh, this is an absolutely wonderful little plane. And again, you can see how everything's just simpler. We don't have a 1,000. We still have the corrugation, uh, just like we saw back in the 30s. We have the huge counter control here. Um, notice our fuel gauges are actually nice and easy to read. They're just chilling. Uh, we have the presence of the good old-fashioned red button that we got. Notice all of our instruments are marked in a logical way, uh, something we didn't have as much. Again, it wasn't standardized. A lot of that stuff came much, much later as uh, you know, technology and safety basically demanded it, uh, especially with the evolution of some of these controls. Other uh, things we see, of course, is we're starting to get a lot of warning. And uh, that's one of the things I find kind of interesting. You know, that's one of the things I actually joke about here is uh, one of the things that has changed is as the rules of aviation started to get better and more expanded upon, you start to see this whole new era of, uh, I almost call it liability. And uh, like I said, I will get into that in the next film a little bit. But this is a great little plane. I've got time in this in the real world. As I always joke, you have to really like the person you're sitting next to. There's no room, but at least we have comfort safety belts, we have heat, we have a complete navigational suite, and we've got some pretty good economy, especially given some of the aircraft that let up. Now, as we move into the 1980s, uh, things take a different kind of a turn, and it won't be into the early 2000s that the turn starts to reverse, but even then, it's still affected by those events. But we'll see that on our next episode of Microsoft Flight Simulator's Evolution of Aircraft Design. Enjoy.